Uh, it is our great honor to introduce our first speaker for the Terrence Photonics Open Course of this week. So before they open the open course, and I'd like first to introduce our first speaker, Professor Tobias Kempfas. And Professor Tobias Kempfas got his PhD degree from High um, Universität Berlin, and then worked as a postdoc uh, fellow at the FOM Institute for Atomic and Molecular Physics in Amsterdam. Later, he worked as a research group leader at the Fritz Haber Institute in Berlin and joined in High Universität Berlin as a full professor of experimental physics since 2017. His research topics are study and control of ultrafast processes in complex solids, for example, terahertz dynamics and terahertz transport of electrons and spins in nanostructures and at the interfaces, and also nonlinear terahertz spectroscopy of solvents and terahertz photonics. Okay, so let's want to welcome our professor Tobias Kempfaff to give the 101st terahertz open course. Okay. So, so this talk will be about terahertz emission spectroscopy. And uh, first, I would like to a little bit give a tutorial in terahertz emission spectroscopy, why it's actually such a great technique. And uh, in the second part, I would like to address how you can also apply it to spintronic processes and spintronic materials. Before I start, please uh, give me the opportunity to uh, briefly uh, mention the people that have contributed to the results that I will show in the following. So first of all, it's the terahertz physics group here at the Free University in Berlin, but also in the Max Planck Society at the Fritz Haber Institute. And um, well, if you do spectroscopy, you need access to high quality samples. And we were very lucky in this respect because we got samples from the groups of Matthias Kloy in Mainz, Markus Munzenberg in Greifswald, and Georg Woltersdorf in Halle-Wittenberg, all in Germany. And uh, finally, if you would like to understand your results, it's uh, very helpful to have contact with uh, theorists. And again, here we were very fortunate. We got a strong support by the group of Peter Oppenier at Uppsala University in Sweden, and also here at the Free University of Berlin in the group of Pete Brauer. Okay, now I'm ready to start. And uh, please let me start with a question. Why do we actually need terahertz emission spectroscopy? In short, TES. Uh, actually, I was thinking about this for quite a while, and I think a good answer is as follows. Because photocurrents are ubiquitous in science and technology. So what, what are photocurrents? So photocurrents are just electrical currents which are induced by light. And uh, let me just give you a few examples of photocurrents. So for example, let's consider a photovoltaic material it typically consists of a donor and an access, uh, acceptor section. And if you excite this with uh, light, you will get a charge current from the donor to the acceptor, acceptor for example, carried by electrons. And uh, the field of the light is an electromagnetic field, of course, and its electric field component we here describe or label as E and XP. And the current that we induce has a current density, a charge current density, which we here label or show as the symbol J as a function of spatial position R and time T. But there's, of course, many more examples of photocurrents. You can, for example, also consider such an ele optoelectronic device, sometimes called a photoconductor switch. So you just take a semiconductor, bias it with an electric field, a DC electric field of about one kilovolts per centimeter and excited with light. You generate then electrons and holes and these electrons and holes are uh, accelerated in this bias field and therefore you obtain a photocurrent. Then you can also have uh, photocurrents and molecules. Consider, for example, uh, bacterial rhodopsin, which consists of two segments one which is rather negatively charged and another segment which is rather positively charged. If you're now excited with light, you get a charge transfer from this B minus region and to this A plus region. And this is this charge transfer, this photo induced charge transfer is nothing but a photocurrent. And uh, finally, you can also think about thermoelectric current. Let's consider, for example, a metal film excited with light. And uh, we know that the light field will be attenuated on a on a length scale of uh, tens of nanometers. So this means we induce a temperature gradient in our material. And this, and this temperature gradient uh, also so-called 
thermoelectric currents can flow, uh, for example, due to the famous Seebeck effect. So electrons will then, for example, flow from the hot to the cold regions of this metal film. So all of these are examples of photocurrents. And you see that these are very uh, diverse examples. And uh, this just illustrates that indeed photocurrents are ubiquitous in science and technology. And uh, there's one important feature about photocurrents. Mostly, in most cases, they scale quadratically with the electric field of the driving uh, light uh, field. Uh, so you can also say that the induced photocurrent density is proportional to the light power that you send into the material. So by just using a very simple symmetry consideration, it quickly follows that you will only get a volume integrated photocurrent. So you just check the photocurrent density integrated over the whole volume of your material. And this is then the photocurrent. And this photocurrent is only non-zero if uh, your sample has broken inversion symmetry. And the broken inversion symmetry you can induce by two measures. So either you can get broken inversion symmetry by the sample structure. That's, for example, the case here for the photovoltaic material. Here we have the donor and here an acceptor. And this clearly breaks the inversion symmetry. But you can also break inversion symmetry uh, by the light field itself. And this is, for example, shown here for the thermoelectric current. So this is a metal film, which is uh, by itself inversion symmetric. However, the light field uh, generates such a gradient, a temperature gradient here, and in this way breaks the inversion symmetry of the sample. And uh, these two examples here are again uh, cases of uh, broken inversion symmetry due to the sample structure. Well, and it's important to note that all these photocurrents uh, often, very often, actually proceed on ultra fast timescales. So, how can we understand this? What I show you here on the right hand side is a schematic of a solid. It consists of all these um, atoms or ionic uh, cores. And here we have an electron. And the distance between two um, uh, neighboring ions is the lattice constant. It's of the order of one nanometer. And now, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one can say that a conduction electron traverses actually one elementary cell very fast, yeah, very quickly, uh, and just about one to 10 femtoseconds. And the reason for this is that the Fermi velocity of electrons and typical metals, for example, or doped semiconductors is of the order of one nanometer per femtosecond. That means, so one unit cell is traversed in about one to 10 femtoseconds. But uh, when such an electron flies through a solid, it will not fly ballistically forever. No, at a certain point, of course, it will collide. It will collide with an obstacle with an obstacle and then start stop moving. And uh, these collisions um, are, for example, caused by phonons. This means crystal lattice vibrations, as you as I show you here schematically. So the electron travels, then collides with an obstacle. And these collisions uh, occur on time scales of 1 to 50 femtoseconds. So that's the time between two consecutive uh, collisions of such a conduction electrons. And uh, as said, this can be caused, for example, by phonons, so the vibrations of the crystal lattice of the solid. And uh, this brings me to the next ultra fast time scale. So, one phonon oscillation period in a solid is typically 100 femtoseconds. So, within 100 femtoseconds, the ions make a full oscillation cycle. And finally, the electrons will deliver their excess energy to the phonons, so to the crystal lattice. And this occurs on a time scale of typically half a picosecond. And this is also called electron phonon equilibration, so energy equilibration. How long does it take until electrons and phonons in a solid uh, equilibrate in terms of their energy? So all of this shows that actually um, electron currents and solids are occurring or proceeding on ultra fast time scales. And uh, it would be, of course, great to measure such electron currents. And that's why the question is, how can we actually time resolve such photocurrents on the femtosecond time scale? So let's consider the problem again. Here we have our sample. We have with the light field. The light field induces a photocurrent. And the photocurrent, of course, we can most easily measure by just using an ampere meter. But it's important to note that electron currents in this way can only be detected 
up to frequencies of about 50 gigahertz. And at these frequencies, it's already, already getting prohibitively expensive. For example, you need very fast oscilloscopes, and these are usually pretty costly. However, this is not enough, yeah, because we expect a bandwidth of more than 10 terahertz, simply because the driving light field is a femtosecond pump pulse. Why do we use here a femtosecond pump pulse? Well, because we would like to induce ultra-fast uh, photocurrents. That's why we drive the photocurrent with a femtosecond pump pulse. And uh, this will induce a current with a bandwidth of uh, 1 over 10 to 100 femtoseconds, which means tens of terahertz. Unfortunately, we cannot measure this with simple normal electronics. And the question is now, how can we measure such a fast photocurrent? And interestingly, the solution is actually quite simple. Let's just throw away all these contacts and realize that this photocurrent here is nothing but the superposition of many Hertzian dipoles. And all these Hertzian dipoles oscillate at various frequencies from zero Hertz up to tens of terahertz. And as such, these Hertzian dipoles will emit electromagnetic radiation. And this electromagnetic radiation will also cover the terahertz frequency range. And that's why the goal is, let's try to measure the electric field of such an emitted electromagnetic pulse. And uh, well, this can be done indeed with a very nice technique. And this technique is called electro-optic sampling. And I show it uh, schematically here. So what we have here is a so-called electro-optic crystal, for example, zinc telluride or gallium phosphide. Now we send a terahertz pulse into this nonlinear optical crystal. And let's, for example, consider this instant of space and time. At this instant of space and time, the electric field of the terahertz pulse is negative. It points toward the bottom of the slide. And uh, because the crystal here in which this happens is electro-optic, the refractive index of the material will be changed at this position a little bit along this direction, but not perpendicular to the plane of my screen. What does this mean? If we now send a co-propagating sampling pulse through the crystal, then this pulse will feel that in this direction, the refractive index is a little bit different and proportional to the terahertz field, there is in the direction perpendicular to it. So out of the screen plane, the refractive index has not changed. So this means at this position of the sampling pulse, uh, the crystal is temporarily or transiently birefringent. And that's something we can perfectly measure because a linearly polarized sampling pulse will then eventually be transformed into an elliptical, uh, elliptically polarized um, sampling pulse. And as a matter of fact, the electric field, uh, the, the ellipticity that the sampling pulse has acquired is directly proportional to the electric field of the terahertz pulse at the position of the sampling pulse. And all we need to do now is just change the delay between the sampling pulse and the terahertz pulse. And in this way, we can step by step measure the electric field of the terahertz pulse. And uh, that's a really great technique because it allows us to get access, full access to the characteristics of the terahertz pulse. So not only the intensity or the like, we really can measure actually the electric field of our terahertz trace. And the question is now, how can one implement such a terahertz emission setup in the lab? And uh, it's possible, for example, with this very simplistic setup that I show you here. So what do we have here? So here from the back, we have the pump beam, the optical pump beam, it hits a sample, and in this sample, a photocurrent is induced. The sample uh, where the photocurrent flows accordingly emits the terahertz radiation. The terahertz radiation, uh, for example, propagates in the forward direction, is then deflected by this dichroic mirror to the right-hand side, and finally hits this parabolic mirror. And this parabolic mirror focuses the terahertz radiation into this electro-optic crystal here, zinc telluride or gallium phosphide or other uh, electro-optic materials. Now we need a sampling pulse to detect the terahertz pulse. And this comes here from the left-hand side. It's the probe beam. It here hits another dichroic mirror. It's silicon. At the silicon surface, it's reflected and now co-propagates with the terahertz field and finally uh, traverses the electro electro optic crystal where it can sample the terahertz electric field. And behind this crystal, we just measure the ellipticity 
of the sampling pulse by a combination of quarter wave plates and uh, uh, polarizers and photodiodes. So this is a very simplistic uh, setup for terahertz emission spectroscopy. And the question is now, of course, how can we actually conduct terahertz emission spectroscopy? How does it work? What are the typical work steps of this uh, spectroscopy method? And uh, I show you the basic steps here. So the first thing would be, well, it would be great to first measure uh, the emitted terahertz radiation. So let's probe the terahertz electric field, which is incident on the detector. This is, of course, the first work step in terahertz emission spectroscopy. As a second step, then, we analyze the polarization of this emitted terahertz pulse. We try to learn whether this pulse is, for example, linearly polarized or elliptically polarized. And this is something we can easily do by inserting uh, terahertz polarizers here. And these terahertz polarizers are typically uh, wire grid polarizers. Okay. And once we've done this, we go further and we study the impact of uh, certain parameters on the emitted terahertz radiation. For example, we can study the impact of the pump properties. So the power dependence on the pump radiation, the impact of the polarization of the pump pulse, its wavelength. Uh, then we can also look into geometrical parameters, for example, the sample azimuth or the tilt of the sample. And uh, if uh, we have more uh, av uh, parameters available that we can vary exper experimentally, of course, we will do this. And this can, for example, be the temperature of the sample or external fields like a magnetic field or an electric field. But uh, let's now look at examples yeah, from the literature, how people uh, do terahertz emission spectroscopy. And I show you here one example from the group of uh, uh, Tono Uchi in Osaka. So he uh, studied a multi-ferroic multi material, which is called bismuth ferrite. So bismuth ferrite is a very interesting material. It's uh, both ferroelectric and anti-ferromagnetic at the same time. Yeah? And that's why it's called multi-ferroic. Uh, Tono Uchi and his group were very interested in the ferroelectric properties of the sample. So ferroelectric means that the sample, shown here in the plane, has a permanent polarization P, so a certain density of electric dipoles, which forms spontaneously in this ferroelectric material. Then they biased the sample with gold electrodes to induce a monodomain polarization, and uh, then they switched the bias off and excited the sample with a pump laser pulse and measured the emitted terahertz radiation. And the emitted terahertz waveforms are shown here. Here is the amplitude as a function of time. And you see they indeed measure such a blue waveform here. And the blue waveform they obtained after the application of 200 kilovolts per centimeter, so in the direction uh, to the top here. And then they uh, switched off the, 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 the bias electric field and measured this blue waveform. Then they again switched on the bias, but now they polarized the sample in the opposite direction by applying a bias in the opposite direction with minus 200 kilovolts per centimeter. And then they switched the bias off again, resulting in a static polarization, excited again with a pump laser pulse, and then they obtained this red waveform here. And you should see that the waveform perfectly changes polarity, it uh, perfectly reverses its dynamics, and uh, this is already a clear indication that what they measure here is indeed um, a signature of this ferroelectric uh, polarization. And you can now use, for example, the signal to learn more about the ferroelectric properties of the material. And uh, you can also use this to image actually the polarization as a function of the sp spatial position in the XY plane. And this is what they did. You see this in this image here. So the yellow lines show again these uh, electrodes here, these gold electrodes. And you see that in between the electrodes, the color is uh, blue, which means here they have a, polar, a positive polarization or positive ferroelectric polarization. But here at the side, the color is blue, uh, sorry, red. And this means they measure a negative polarization. Yeah? And in this way, they could nicely image the distribution of the ferroelectric polarization in between these two electrodes. And you see that uh, at the side of these electrodes on the top or the bottom, no clear uh, terahertz emission is seen, which means that basically the ferroelectric polarization there is more or less zero. So I should say that uh, photocurrents can also oscillate periodically. And this can, for example, be seen 
in other samples like quantum bells. Yeah? And these are experiments done by the groups of Paul Planken and Martin Nuss. A long while ago, 30 years ago, these were one of the first terahertz emission works. So what they took was basically semiconductor quantum bells. It's not important to know how these exactly work. It's only important to know that these uh, quantum bells can support uh, discrete quantum states, one, two, three, shown here, one, two, three. And by using the femtosecond pump pulse, one can form a coherent superposition of all these uh, quantum states. And uh, as a result of this, you get a coherent superposition also of the wave functions of these quantum mechanical states. And uh, the superposition of these wave functions leads to a oscillation of the electron density and therefore also uh, of and uses electronic currents. And these electronic currents oscillate periodically and emit terahertz radiation. And this is indeed what they observed. Here's the terahertz signal as a function of time. And you see that uh, at certain photon energies of the pump pulse, they indeed see clear uh, oscillations, which uh, are signatures of a coherent superposition of these quantum states here. And you see that the terahertz emission is extremely sensitive to the photon energy. They vary the photon energy only very little here, but obtain very different oscillations. And uh, modeling then shows that these are indeed signatures of these quantum well state oscillations. And uh, you see that you can that we can already recognize these oscillations without much analysis of the terahertz waveforms. There's not much we have to do. You see the oscillations directly in the time domain. But the question is now, what happens if the data are not as clear as here now? How can we extract more intrinsic information that is that is carried by these terahertz signal waveforms? And this then leads us to advanced work steps of terahertz emission spectroscopy. And uh, you can also say uh, when you do these advanced work steps that you use terahertz emission spectro spectroscopy as an ultra fast ampere meter. So we really try to calculate back to the current that flows inside the material. So how does this work? So this is what we measure. We measure the terahertz signal S versus T, which is at the end of the day, just the voltage that comes from our photodiodes. So it would already be a first great steps, great step to calculate back from this terahertz signal S to the terahertz electric field directly behind the sample. So this is work step four. And once we have this terahertz electric field, we can calculate actually back to the photo current that was flowing inside the sample. And this means then that we would have developed uh, an ampere meter, but not a normal ampere meter, but rather an ampere meter for ultra fast photo currents. And once we have this current, uh, also interpretation and modeling of what's going on inside a sample becomes much more easy. Okay, so how can we now implement this work step number four? How can we get back from the measured terahertz signal to the uh, terahertz field? So this means we have to a little bit analyze what's actually going on in a terahertz emission spectrometer. So here we have the photo current. Here's the terahertz electric field directly behind the sample. This is what we would like to know. Unfortunately, this is not what we measure because the terahertz field uh, propagates to the detection and uh, on its way to the detection, it's collimated, it's focused. And uh, only after it hits the detector, we get our signal S of T. And how are the electric field of the terahertz pulse behind a sample and the terahertz signal are connected to each other? They are connected by a so-called transfer function H. Uh, the reason is that the terahertz signal depends linearly on the terahertz electric field behind the sample. So this relationship between the signal that we measure and the signal that you would like to know is simply linear. And in frequency space, you can very easily write down this uh, linear relationship. The signal that we measure at a certain frequency is simply the product of our electric field that we would want to know times some uh, transfer function that describes the characteristics of our terahertz emission setup. And uh, well, if we knew this setup transfer function, it would be easy to solve this equation for E and therefore determine the terahertz electric field behind a sample. The question is, how can we get this uh, setup transfer function? There's basically two possibilities. You can calculate it, which means you have to calculate the propagation of your uh, terahertz field. Or what is actually better, better, you can measure your transfer function by using a known reference emitter. So if you have a reference emitter, 
for which you know the induced electric field, you can use it to uh, measure the signal and then solve this equation for the transfer function. And once you know H, we can easily solve for the electric uh, field of uh, yeah behind the sample. This is what we want to know. So let me just uh, show you a typical transfer function in a typical terahertz setup. So this is calculated, but it very nicely agrees also with what we measure. So what do we have here? So this is the amplitude of our transfer function as a function of frequency from zero to 30 terahertz. And you see at low frequencies, we have a high pass behavior. So we have very little uh, amplitude at zero frequency. And this just means that low frequencies and uh, in the extreme case, zero hertz or DC can simply not propagate into free space. That's why we get this low pass behavior here. Uh, sorry, this high pass behavior here. At higher frequencies, you see that we also get a roll off of our uh, transfer function amplitude. And this low pass behavior, for example, arises because our probe pulse, which measures the terahertz electric field, has a finite duration. It's not infinitely short. And finally, you also see structure here, some features, and they arise uh, from certain uh, features of the refractive index and other optical properties of the detection material. And uh, in this case, this is gallium phosphide. It's also interesting to look at the uh, transfer function actually in the time domain. So this is in the frequency domain. You can now take this transfer function, including the phase, and inversely Fourier transform it. And then you get it in the time domain. And this is a, a terahertz signal that you would measure if your terahertz field would be a delta pulse. So if you would have a emitted terahertz pulse that would look like a delta function, then this is the signal that you would measure. And you see indeed here at time zero, we still get uh, a signature of this delta pulse. This looks like a very sharp peak. So it's a remainder of the delta pulse that we have sent into the setup. However, we also have a signal at negative times. This means here we detect terahertz components, which are faster than our probe pulse. Yeah? They propagate faster through the detection crystal than our, than our probe pulse. And finally here, at positive times, we also see signals, and they come from slower components of the of the terahertz pulse. For example, in these frequency regions, which are sometimes called the reststrahlen uh, bands of the crystal gallium phosphide. Okay, so this is now the the procedure how we can get from the terahertz signal to the terahertz field directly behind the sample. But finally, we would like to know about the photocurrent that was flowing inside the sample. So how can we get there? And uh, well, here we a little bit need to do uh, theory. Uh, we need to know how does this uh, photocurrent, which is shown here as a function of the in-depth position inside the sample, how does this photocurrent generate a terahertz or an electromagnetic wave? Well, so let's take this photocurrent here uh, in the thickness of the sample. And let's, for example, consider this slice of the photocurrent. This slice here of the photocurrent at this position Z prime will emit a terahertz wave, which has an amplitude which is proportional to the amplitude of the photocurrent at this slice position times a function, which is basically an outgoing spherical wave. Uh, technically, it's called the Green's function. So this slice here of the photocurrent will generate a terahertz pulse, which propagates to the right hand side. And uh, it has this amplitude. Now we can look, for example, also at this position of the uh, photocurrent, at this slice, and again, we will get such a spherical wave propagating to the right-hand side. Now the amplitude is proportional to the photocurrent at this position, Z2 prime. You can also do this uh, for Z3 prime, this instant of a, of a slice here, and so on and so on. Basically, you have to do it for all slices that make up the photocurrent. And if you do this and add up all these partial waves here, you get the total emitted terahertz electric field. And uh, well, these are the, this is the current from a slice and you just need to add them up and adding up means just you need to integrate them. And uh, well, this is the theory behind it. And often you can apply a very nice approximation here because often our film, our sample is very thin. And this means that basically the Green's function here doesn't change over the thickness of the sample. So we can evaluate the Green's function or the spherical wave at position Z and Z prime uh, equaling to zero. Then we can pull out the Green's function out of the integral and we basically get the integral 
over the, the photo current here. And this is also called the sheet photo current. So the integral over the photo current uh, density. And uh, this equation actually has a very nice intuitive interpretation, which I would like to share with you on the next slide. So if you haven't understood this completely, don't worry. It has a very nice intuitive interpretation, which I try to show you here on the next slide. So again, we have here our sample in which the photo current slows, uh, flows. Now it's here the, the total integrated thickness integrated photo current density, so the sheet current density. And well, the sample sits on a substrate on the left hand side, which has refractive index N1. And on the right hand side, we have another half space, for example, air with refractive index N2. Okay. And uh, this photo current produces the terahertz electric field. And it's now nice to know and important to emphasize that this situation for very thin films can be mapped on an electrical circuit onto an equivalent electrical circuit, which is shown here. So this is the photo current that flows and it has to traverse the resistance of our thin film, which is shown here. But note that this is not the total resistance or impedance of the system. The, the photo current can also pass through other uh, impedances namely the impedance of the substrate here on the left-hand side, which has the impedance Z1. And this is something you can calculate. You just need to take the free space impedance Z0 divided by the refractive index of the substrate N1, and then you have it. And also on the right-hand side, we have an impedance, which is summarized here by the Z2. You also get it by just dividing the free space impedance Z0 divided by the refractive index N2 of uh, the right half space. Well, and then we are there, yeah? So we just take a basic electrostatics and we calculate the electric field on the right-hand side by just multiplying the photo current with uh, the total impedance of the system here. And the total impedance of the system we can easily calculate because it's simply a parallel connection of resistances. And we know that the inverse total resistance or impedance is just the sum of all inverse impedances and uh, this is shown here by this equation. You can now take this equation, solve it for Z, and this is then the result that you get. And uh, well, that's that's the electrostatic view on this problem here. So the electric field behind the sample is given by this Ohm's law, this generalized Ohm's law. And all you need to know is the impedance of the sample, but it's simply given by this parallel connection of uh, partial impedances of the left-hand side uh, of the thin film itself and of the right hand side uh, of the thin film. Okay, let's now summarize this procedure of the advanced work steps of terahertz emission spectroscopy. So that's what we measure, the terahertz electric field. We can take it, calculate back to the electric field of the terahertz pulse behind the sample. And from this, we can finally calculate back to the total integrated photocurrent that was flowing inside the sample. Well, and the final step, interpretation and modeling I will now illustrate for various examples. So now let's look at a, at a two examples of this advanced um, work steps of terahertz emission spectroscopy. And uh, the first example is a classic one, more than 20 years old, uh, but it aged very well. It's by Alfred Leitenstorfer. So what did Alfred do? Well, he took a P, a PIN semiconductor heterostructure biased it with a voltage. So you apply the voltage between the P layer and the N layer, and then excited the whole thing with a femtosecond laser pulse. Then a photocurrent was flowing out of the plane of the system and emitting terahertz radiation that he was then detecting here uh, by electro-optic sampling. And this is the electro-optic signal that he measured. Here's the, the photodiode current of his electro-optic detection as a function of time. And you see it looks pretty complex with oscillations up and down. Uh, but then he applied the inversion procedure that we just discussed, and he obtained this photocurrent. I should say that this is not the photocurrent that Alfred shows here. It's rather the time derivative of the photocurrent. So it's you can also say it's the 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 derivative of the velocity of the electrons, and the derivative of the, uh, the electron velocity is nothing but the acceleration of the electrons. So what you see here is basically the acceleration of the electrons flowing in the direction out of the plane of this semiconductor heterostructure. So what is the interpretation now of this curve here? There you see at negative delay, there's no photocurrent, but then the, the 
the light pulse arrives and the acceleration of the electrons increases immediately. So this just means that this bias voltage accelerates the electrons. Then uh, the acceleration becomes less because uh, the electrons enter dense structure regions with less slope and that's why you get less acceleration. And finally, you see that the acceleration becomes negative. So this means we have deceleration and this arises because the electrons scatter with phonons inside the material. Yeah? And in this way, they lose velocity and they are decelerated. They are braked. And uh, well, this is a really nice example of uh, yeah, terahertz emission spectroscopy and measuring at the end of the day, ultra fast photo currents, yeah? like with an ampere meter. Uh, let me show you a second example from the group of Tony Heinz. Uh, so what did they do? They took a, a, a semiconductor heterostructure, but now made of transition, transition metal digel cogenides, tungsten disulfide and molybdenum disulfide. And uh, they excited this with a femtosecond laser pulse. And in this way, they induced the charge transfer from one TMDC, so transition metal digel cogenide, into another one. And uh, these are the terahertz signals they measured. And you see when they reverse the structure, turn the structure around by 180 degrees, then the terahertz signal changes sign. Yeah? I see here the blue waveform and the red waveform. They are almost perfectly reversed versions of each other, which indicates that this is indeed an out of plane current, which whose symmetry is dictated by the inversion symmetry or broken inversion symmetry of the sample. And uh, they were also able to extract currents. They did it a little bit, a little bit more indirectly, and they could basically extract uh, or conclude back to two scenarios with different time constants of the photocurrents, which are shown here. So um, they could also extract the efficiency of this photocurrent here, and they found a quantum efficiency of as high as 70%. Okay, so I hope with these two examples, I could show you that terahertz emission spectroscopy is actually a really nice tool to study and understand ultra fast photocurrents, which are carried by the charges of, for example, electrons. But the question is now, how can we transfer this technique to the spin dynamics and spintronics? And uh, are there applications? And uh, uh, Xiao Jun, I don't know. Uh, so since I now change to Spintronics, it would be a good opportunity to discuss questions about the uh, terahertz emission spectroscopy technique and technology. Oh. If, if there are questions, we could do this now. Okay. Uh, can I yeah. ask a question? Yeah, here comes question. Uh, okay, you are. Yeah. Uh, uh, from the signal to the, uh, to the uh, transmitted, uh, uh, electric field, uh, the uh, the convolution function h omega. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to ask uh, uh, how to calculate this uh, function. Is this function uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, only depend on the uh, experimental setup, or uh, also depend on the materials? Uh, so the question was. So this setup transfer function, yeah, uh, does it yeah. depend on the setup uh, and the materials? And you're right, it depends on both. Yeah, it depends on both the material of the electro optic crystal that we use for the terahertz detection, but it also depends on the setup. Yeah, how do you arrange your lenses? And um, well, when you uh, calculate your transfer function, you make a crucial assumption. You assume that your setup is perfectly aligned. And of course, uh, setups are not always uh, perfectly aligned. Uh, they are m imperfections. And that actually makes the calculation of the setup transfer function a bit challenging. And that's why in our lab, what we do, we use a, a reference terahertz emitter to, to measure this transfer function. Uh, in a second step, we com uh, com compared to a, to a modeled transfer function to see whether it's reasonable or not. But in principle, we measure it. We more uh, rely on the experimental approach. Uh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are there other questions from the Zoom, the, the room of this online meeting? And we will correct some other questions from the, some other online platform, and uh, we will ask uh, these questions later. After okay, good, great. Right. Yeah. Okay, no, totally fine. Yeah, then we can also do it later. Yes.
So should I go on now then? Mm, depends on you. If you have one to five, uh, several minutes break or uh, we we uh, I would say let's let's uh, I don't need a break. I can go on. Yeah, but uh, okay. If, uh, if you want to take a okay, a please break. go on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then I go on. Yeah. yeah thank you. Okay, so now let's talk. Uh, let's turn to Spiltronics. Yeah. So, so up to now, all these uh, photo currents were arising from charge currents. Yeah. So the charge of the electrons. But we know actually that electrons not only have a charge, as indicated by this uh, red sphere here, but they also have a spin, which is indicated by this blue arrow here. And uh, a spin of the electron also implies that the electron has a magnetic moment, just like a compass needle. And uh, this compass needle is simply this arrow here. It's a magnetic dipole. And uh, even though uh, the spin and the magnetic moment of the electron is uh, usually a small effect, it's very su successfully used in an important uh, field of physics research, namely spintronics, and in more general, the field of magnetism. And uh, what people want to do in spintronics, they want to use um, the spin of the electron for information processing. And uh, information can, for example, be stored by the direction of the spin. So spin up means bit one, uh, spin down means bit zero. And uh, well, writing information then means that we need to turn spins around. And this means we need to apply torque to the electron spins. And this is the first elementary operation that you need to implement if you want to do spintronics, turn spins around. Second, you also would like to transport spin information, but this means you simply need to transport spin polarized electrons through space. You can also say you would like to launch spin currents. And finally, of course, you want to know what you've done. And that's why you need to be able to detect spin dynamics by some suitable detector. And uh, a goal, uh, an important goal uh, of our group is we would like to push these operations to terahertz speed. Why do we want to do this? Well, because competing information carriers like electrons and field effect transistors or photons and optical fibers, they already have been demonstrated and are even being used at very high bandwidths of terahertz. And if spintronics uh, has to be uh, competitive or should be competitive and compatible with these other uh, information carriers in photonics and in electronics, then we also need to push these operations to the terahertz range. And uh, well, let's do this and let's start with operation number one. How can we actually trigger and probe terahertz spin precession? And uh, one can do this very nicely with a special class of magnets, so-called anti-ferromagnets. And the uh, anti-ferromagnet is shown here. You see that here the spins are um, oriented uh, in opposite directions. So adjacent spins uh, point in opposite direction. So this means uh, here up, down, up, down, up, down, and so on. So this means that the total magnetization, the total magnetic moment of an anti-ferromagnet is actually zero. And at first glance, this looks a little bit strange and why should it be useful? But actually anti-ferromagnets are highly interesting for spintronics. For example, for ultra fast spin control. For example, you could take this arrangement and turn it by 90 degrees, turn it by 90 degrees. And then you could, for example, encode a bit zero and a bit one. And uh, why is this interesting for ultra fast spin control? Well, the spin precessions, the so-called magnons or spin waves and these materials have very high frequencies. So these spins can bobble or precess or oscillate with frequencies uh, reaching the terahertz frequency range, one to 10 terahertz. But there's a problem. The characterization of these antiferromagnets and their magnons is non-trivial. And the big question is now, does terahertz emission spectroscopy help here? Is uh, terahertz emission spectroscopy useful here? And the answer is yes. And uh, it works as follows. We take an antiferromagnet and kick it with a femtosecond pump pulse. The femtosecond pump pulse will then for a very short moment rearrange the electrons and the antiferromagnet. And as a consequence, we induce torque on the spins here. So this means the uh, spins are a little bit deflected uh, out of their equilibrium direction. And once the pump pulse is gone, um, they want to go back into their equilibrium position. 
But what you see here now is that the top spin is a little bit uh, turned to the bottom side, and so is the second spin. But what does this mean? That we induce now a magnet magnetic moment along this vertical direction. In other words, what we induce is a time-dependent magnetization which oscillates in this direction. But if you have a time-dependent magnetization, you also have a time-dependent magnetic dipole, and this means we have a Hertzian dipole, but this time it's not an electric dipole, it's a magnetic dipole. And this magnetic dipole will also again emit uh, terahertz radiation. And that's something we can detect by electro-optic sampling. And this was done by the group of Hang Yo in uh, Osaka about 10 years ago. So he took an anti-ferromagnet, manganese oxide, uh, put it into a cryostat to uh, make it uh, anti-ferromagnetic. And then he excited it with a linearly polarized pump radiation. And then he measured this red waveform here. You see in the very beginning, we get a, a short uh, broadband emission. But then later, we see some oscillation. And uh, this oscillation is pretty long-lived. And when you take a Fourier transformation of this terahertz signal, you obtain the red spectrum shown here. And you see the spectrum has a clear peak at one terahertz, which is exactly corresponding to this oscillation here. And it turns out that this uh, oscillation here is indeed a magnon, so a spin precession and manganese oxide. And it's also something uh, that you control by uh, uh, changing the polarization of your pump pulse. For example, when you use circularly uh, polarized pump pulses, this oscillation disappears, as shown here by this blue curve. You can now do the following. You can take the amplitude of this uh, one terahertz oscillation and measure it as a function as of the temperature of the sample. And then you obtain such a curve here. So the, the oscillation frequency of this spin wave uh, becomes smaller and smaller. And all of a sudden, at the critical temperature, the so-called NEL temperature, the oscillation disappears. And the oscillation frequency disappears. It becomes lower and lower. And uh, you can also then fit this to a model. And this model then gives you the NEL temperature uh, of the antiferromagnet. So the NEL temperature is the temperature at which the material goes from the antiferromagnetic phase into the non-magnetic phase. And this NEL temperature is something that is not easy to measure. But here you can really nicely measure it by simply looking at the frequency of the emitted terahertz wave. And I should say that this is hard to do without optics. So terahertz emission spectroscopy is really a nice technique technique to do this here. And uh, I should also say uh, these waveforms give you even more information. They give you insights into the internal magnetic fields of the solid, for example, into the exchange field and also the so-called anisotropy fields. OK, so you can say that terahertz emission spectroscopy is actually a powerful tool to characterize anti-ferromagnets and spin precession. And uh, it's being used a lot by scientists in, in magnetism and also in terahertz photonics. OK, so this was the first operation, turning spins around. But the question is now, can we also uh, study spin transport by means of terahertz emission spectroscopy? And uh, well, the first we would need uh, a method to induce such spin transport, such spin currents. So how can we do this? So what would be nice to have something like a spin battery, not a battery for electrical charge currents, but rather a battery for terahertz spins. And one idea for such a spin battery is shown here. So we take a ferromagnet, iron, for example, and we know in iron uh, the spins order spontaneously in the same direction. That's why it's a ferromagnet. And that's why the iron film becomes magnetic. Yeah, It uh, carries a magnetization M. If we now increase the temperature, we know that the magnetization shrinks, it becomes less and less. And at a certain point, it even becomes zero. And then the material iron becomes paramagnetic, non-magnetic. You can also translate this in a little bit simpler language. You could say, well, upon heating, the electrons of a ferromagnet want to release spin angular momentum. So the electrons would like to get rid of their angular momentum. And this happens locally. So at a certain spatial position by transfer of the spin angular momentum to the crystal lattice. And this uh, basically suggests the following idea. Let's also allow the electrons to release their spin not only by spin flips, 
uh, by spin transfer to the L, uh, to the crystal lattice, but also let's allow the electrons to get rid of their spin by transport out of the ferromagnetic layer. So how can we do this? Well, we just take the ferromagnet, but now attach to the right hand side a metal layer, for example, platinum. And this metal layer now can act as a sink for spins coming from the ferromagnet. I should also mention that by adding this non-magnetic layer here, we break the symmetry of the system. And this means we basically allow for photocurrents uh, by breaking the inversion symmetry. And uh, well, let's now heat the ferromagnet as fast as possible. So how can we do this? Well, that's very easy. We just take a femtosecond laser pulse. It will increase the temperature of the ferromagnetic layer, which will then hopefully also drive spins into the adjacent platinum layer because the ferromagnet wants to get rid of spin angular momentum. And actually, this works. And this was already shown uh, over the past 15 years and, and many works. Some of them are shown here. Uh, and this was, uh, yeah, it actually show, shows that this principle is operative. Uh, but our goal was then, well, how can we measure this spin transport by means of spintronic principles? So we would like to measure this spin transport, the spin current, by uh, spintronic effects. And one of these spintronic effects is the so-called inverse spin hall effect. So how does this work? Well, the spin current goes into the uh, non-magnetic metal, for example, platinum. And we know that platinum is a heavy metal. So this means there is a lot of spin orbit coupling. And this means that spin up electrons uh, feel an effective mag magnetic field and are therefore deflected upwards simply because of a Lorentz-like force. But spin down electrons will be deflected downwards. But since we have more spin up electrons than spin down electrons, we end up with a net charge current in the upward direction. And this in-plane charge current is something we can easily measure by simply, yeah, well, measuring the emitted terahertz electromagnetic pulse. And that's why uh, the experiment is clear. We need to measure terahertz emission from such photo excited stacks consisting of a ferromagnetic layer F and a non-magnetic layer N. In the samples, we took polar crystalline films, so nothing uh, special. And the pump pulses came from a titanium sapphire oscillator with relatively short pulses of 10 femtoseconds. And these are now typical terahertz signals. What I show you here is the terahertz signal as a function of time. And uh, this uh, the sample we put into an external magnetic field of 20 millitesla just to put it into a well-defined magnetic state. And indeed, what we saw is terahertz emission. And of course, we were ha very happy about this. But now you need to do need to do certain cross checks. And the first cross check that you can do is take this external magnetic field and reverse it to minus 20 millitesla then measure again. And importantly, the terahertz waveform almost completely reverses its shape. And this is already a strong indication that the signal that we see here is uh, originating from the magnetic properties of the sample. Okay, let's do more cross checks. So this is the terahertz waveform from an iron platinum sample. Now let's grow platinum and iron in reverse order. Now the spin current should flow from the right to the left hand side. And therefore, also the terahertz waveform should re reverse. And indeed, it does. And that's uh, also confirming our, well, our previous idea. And finally, let's omit the platinum. And then uh, we just measure an iron film and we find this, uh, this waveform here, this red waveform. And you see it's much, much smaller, which clearly indicates that you need a platinum layer to get a large terahertz emission amplitude. We did further checks. So we found that the signal is proportional to the pump power. So this is typical of, uh, of all photocurrents. And we also uh, found that the terahertz electric field is linearly polarized. And the direction of the terahertz field is always perpendicular to the sample magnetization. So terahertz electric field yeah, perpendicular to the sample yeah, magnetization. Yeah. So this is typical for any um, Hall yeah. effect, yeah, that the voltage is perpendicular to the external a magnetic field. And all of this is consistent with the scenario that I had just shown you on the previous slide. So uh, spin transport and then uh, the inverse spin hall effect, which generates this charge current.
Okay, but there's more cross checks we have to do. We need more evidence, at least for this spin hole scenario. So how can we do this? Well, we just change the non magnetic material of our FN structure. And uh, we then decided to go for tantalum versus iridium. So why did we do this? Because tantalum and iridium have opposite spin hole angles and iridium has a larger spin hole angle. So here you see the terrace waveform for tantalum, so zero signal, and then you get this oscillation here. Now we replace the tantalum by iridium. And since iridium has in, uh, an opposite spin hole angle, which is larger, the signal from this sample should have a larger amplitude, but should be reversed. So let's see whether this is the case. Yeah, indeed, it is the case. You see that the signal has reversed and it also has a, a larger amplitude compared to the tantalum case. And I think that this is a, a relatively clear um, confirmation that what we have here in these samples is indeed spin transport and the inverse spin hole effect. And uh, that these effects are even possible with terahertz bandwidth. Well, and now the question is, is this just of academic interest or is this useful? And there's ap uh, actually some interesting applications of this uh, terahertz emission spectroscopy of spintronic uh, materials. So first of all, you can try to rapidly char characterize the inverse spin hole effect of non-magnetic materials. You can use this principle to generate terahertz pulses. And finally, you can also learn more about the spin currents that flow in such structures. Let me just briefly give you a few examples of this. So what you have here is the terahertz amplitude as a function of the material of the cap layer. And so for example, chromium, palladium has a large amplitude, tantalum small again, tungsten pretty big, but negative. And then platinum has the biggest terahertz emission amplitude, uh, but in the opposite direction to tungsten. And all of this is actually consistent with uh, values that are known from low frequency spintronics. For example, these blue bars show calculations of the spin hole uh, conductivity. And you see that these blue bars and the measured red bars are quite consistent with each, with each other. So this means that actually the terahertz emission strength yields uh, the relative spin hole conductivity of the material of layer N, as shown here for these examples. And this means that terahertz emission enables actually a rapid and pretty easy screening of materials. And this is uh, important for people in spintronics because they often want to estimate the spin to charge current conversion in these materials. There are also, for example, uh, examples uh, from, from the group of uh, Xiao Zhong Wu. So she, for example, studied topological insulators on top of ferromagnets. And uh, I already mentioned a second application we can, could use such uh, structures to generate terahertz pulses. So, and it turned out that platinum actually delivers the highest terahertz amplitude. But uh, the question is now, how can we optimize the, the terahertz amplitude of such structures? And the most important parameter that you can vary is of course the total thickness of this uh, metal stack. And uh, we did this. Here's the terahertz amplitude as a function of the metal thickness. And uh, you see, interestingly, that the maximum terahertz emission amplitude is obtained for a thickness of five nanometers. And that's a little bit unexpected because usually in nonlinear non optics, you get more amplitude the thicker you make your nonlinear optical material. But here it's uh, a bit unexpected. We get most of the amplitude for a very thin layer of only about five nanometers thickness. Why that? So we did modeling along the lines that I showed you in the beginning of this tutorial. So, and this is then the result of the modeling and you see that the solid curve quite decently agrees with the measured data. And the insight is as follows. Uh, the insight is that the terahertz current only flows in a very thin region close to the iron platinum interface. And this region is only one nanometer thick. And this tells us that it's actually not useful to make the iron platinum layer thicker yeah, because there's no current uh, after one nanometer. And um, what is also important to note, uh, if you make the film thinner, then you could get more uh, reflection echoes of the pump pulse, but also of the terahertz light inside this uh, metal stack. And this enhances the fabi pirot effect. And as a consequence, you get more emission for thinner films. You can also see this alternative, alternatively in an electrostatic picture. 
So we induce a current here, and the current times the uh, resistance of uh, the stack plus the resistances also of the of the other uh, half spaces here, as discussed before, uh, should be as large as possible to get maximum terahertz field here. And it's clear if we make the film thinner and thinner, then we get more and more resistance of this thin film here, and therefore also the terahertz amplitude increases. So also with this uh, alternative electrostatic argument, we find that thinner films get more terahertz emission. But in this graph, you also see uh, more data points here, these red ones here, and uh, they are labeled tri-layers. So this means we, we don't only have here two layers, but actually three layers. So how do they work? It's actually a very simple trick. Here we have the ferromagnet. We get the spin current into the platinum and uh, then the charge current and terahertz emission. But this means we basically neglect the spin current that would flow to the left-hand side. So let's take advantage of this spin current and add another layer here. But if we add platinum, then uh, the structure becomes fully inversion symmetric and we do not get any signal anymore. We have to break the inversion, inversion symmetry again. And we can do this by using tungsten instead of platinum because tungsten has an opposite spin hole angle compared to platinum. And this means that electrons are now deflected also in the upward direction here. And this means that the, the spin hole current from the left layer and the right layer now add up constructively and we get maximum terahertz emission amplitude. And uh, yeah, well, to learn about this, uh, it took uh, about 70 samples in our laboratory. And uh, well, if you want to use this now as a terahertz emitter, you have to evaluate it. And uh, this means you should compare to a standard emitter. And uh, one standard emitter I already mentioned it is, for example, zinc telluride, the electro-optic material, zinc telluride, uh, 0.3 millimeters thick. The emission is shown here. You can fluid transform it, and you see we have a big peak in the beginning at low frequencies and a broader peak at later frequencies and a gap in between. And this gap in between is the famous Reststrahlen gap. So in this region, the refractive index of the zinc telluride is imaginary, and uh, as a consequence, electromagnetic radiation cannot propagate there. And this is not nice. Yeah, For a good terahertz emitter, this region should also be uh, populated with amplitude, but it's not. But let's see whether a metallic spintronic layer can do better. And what you see here is the terahertz waveform unscaled uh, from our zeroth ver version of the spintronic emitter. And you see that the amplitude is very small. And uh, so this can, of course, not at all compete with the standard emitter. But let's see what we get after our uh, optimization procedure we obtained this waveform here. And you see from this tri-layer, we get a waveform which has larger amplitude from than the standard emitter zinc telluride, but also the waveform is much shorter. So the pulse is uh, much shorter, and this indicates that it should have a wider bandwidth. And uh, this is shown here, the spectrum, and you see that the spectrum from the spintronic emitter now completely fills also the regions in which zinc telluride, for example, does not deliver uh, uh, much amplitude. And this indicates that spintronics is not only interesting for building better computers and information technology, it's also interesting for uh, developing more broadband efficient and cheaper uh, emitters of terahertz radiation. And uh, what is interesting about these uh, spintronic structures is, is that they are magnetic and that they consist of metals. And this enables interesting features. One of them is that the emitter is ins insensitive to the pump wavelength, as shown here, for example, from 1,000 to 1,400 nanometers. And uh, at each of these wavelengths, you get the same terahertz emission amplitude. So this is nice. You can use any laser for operating these spintronic terahertz emitters. You can even go down to the terahertz range, and you can even use uh, extreme ultraviolet pulses shown in this paper here from 2022 and uh, this is then this means that uh, terahertz emitters uh, spintronic terahertz are, emitters are interesting for characterizing the shape of xuv pulses so pulses in the extreme ultraviolet or even x-rays then you can easily tune the polarization direction of the emitted terahertz pulses by just playing with the external magnetic field. And you can do this actually also with a quite high frequency of uh, tens of kilohertz. So what you see here is the magnetic field as a function of time. 
And then you then measure the terahertz amplitude. You see that the terahertz amplitude follows accordingly. And this means you can quite quickly at up to 50 kilohertz modulate the amplitude of the terahertz pulse. And this enables applications, for example, like modulation spectroscopy or ellipsometry. And one cannot only um, temporarily modulate the magnetization of the spintronic uh, structure, you can also do it spatially. And this is what, uh, for example, a group from the UK did, United Kingdom, but also the group of Xian Jun Wu. So you can take magnets and uh, generate a more complicated magnetic field distribution in the plane of the spintronic sample. And then you can, for example, generate uh, electric field distributions of your terahertz beams that have, for example, this donut-like beam cross-section. In this way, you can also modulate the polarization spatially of your terahertz pulses and, for example, induce elliptically polarized light, yeah? what, what uh, for example, Xiao Jun Wu did. And, uh, and finally, you can take the spintronic samples and make them larger and larger, which is relatively easy because it's uh, simply made of metal on a, on a substrate. And then you can, for example, uh, build terahertz emitters with a diameter of five centimeters, excited with very intense laser pulses of millijoule um, pulse energy. And in this way, you can crank up the terahertz electric field. And here's an example. Here we reached 0.3 megavolts per centimeter peak field in the focus of the terahertz beam. But meanwhile, we are able to generate more than two megavolts of per centimeter uh, electric field of terahertz pulses. And this makes then um, these emitters interesting also for nonlinear terahertz spectroscopies. And finally, another very nice example from a group in China. So what they did, they took a, a spintronic terahertz emitter, which is shown here, and uh, took advantage of the fact that the terahertz near field of the spintronic emitter is directly above the metal surface. So this means you can do a near field microscopy by putting the sample directly on the terahertz emitter. And now all you need to do is to excite the terahertz emitter with a spatially structured light, for example, little spots, or you take uh, more complicated patterns to get better signal to noise ratio. And in this way, you can do microscopy with the objects directly on top of the terahertz emitter. And in this way, you obtain a resolution of 6.5 micrometers, even though the wavelength of the terahertz radiation is more than 100 micrometers long. And uh, well, all these applications indicate that it would be great if these emitters had even larger emission amplitude. And um, well, um, Xiao Jun, do I still have a little bit of time or should uh, should be discussed now? Once again, in a little summary, so of the spintronic terahertz emission, here's the pump pulse, it drives a spin current from the ferromagnet into the normal metal layer. In the normal metal layer, we get the inverse spin hall effect or more generally spin to charge conversion, which produces an in-plane charge current, which then finally gives rise to the emission of a terahertz pulse. So how can we now maximize the amplitude of the terahertz pulse? So one thing you can try is to optimize the spin to charge current conversion. Uh, so this means you need to take materials with a large, large inverse spin hall effect. And uh, this is, for example, what... Uh, what what is discussed in this uh, review paper uh, from 2021 and uh, there's also works by Xiao Jun uh, Wu I mentioned them so you can also use uh, topological insulators so materials which are uh, uh, exhibiting a very large spin to charge conversion efficiency and uh, sometimes you can also try to play with the interface to get more uh, spin to charge conversion you can try to increase the uh, resistance of the whole stack by making it, making it thinner or by enhancing the resistance by doping it with impurities, by adding impurities, for example, imperfections. Uh, but finally, you can also try to, uh, to get maximum spin current for a given pump pulse energy. And well, so this, this means you need to understand why do you actually get a spin current in the first place? And this brings me to the last application of, uh, of this tutorial. Let's try to understand why spin currents flow by means of terahertz emission spectroscopy. So you can also ask it like that. What is actually the origin of the spin transport from the ferromagnet into the normal metal layer? And uh, so let's remember the, the idea that I mentioned earlier in this talk, 
basically when you excite the, 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 the stack here with a femtosecond laser pulse, you heat it up, you increase the temperature. And this means that this magnet would like to reduce its magnetization. It wants to get rid of spin. It wants to release spin. And uh, for example, the hope was then that it would relieve, release the spin by transport. And to see whether this idea is really correct, we need to compare the spin current dynamics to another important process. Yeah, we need to compare the spin current to dynamics to another important process, namely the ultra fast magnetization quenching that happens also in a ferromagnet without the presence of this normal metal layer. And this ultra fast demagnetization following optical excitation is a very uh, mature process. It was already discussed more than 25 years ago in these works here by Borepeer and, for example, Koopmans. And uh, the question is now, this process, this, well, sorry, this ultra-fast demagnetization, does this have a correlation with the ultra-fast spin transport that we see here in this two-layer stack? And to compare the two processes to each other, it would be, of course, ideal to measure them in one and the same setup. And as you will see, you can measure them in one and the same setup by terahertz emission spectroscopy. So how does this work? Well, the spin current we can measure easily because we know that the spin current is converted into a charge current. And uh, by measuring the terahertz pulse, we can calculate back to the charge current and to the spin current. So this is something that will definitely work. Uh, but what about the ultra fast demagnetization of a single ferromagnetic film? How can we measure this? Well, when you excite the ferromagnet, then the magnetization shrinks, it reduces. But this again means we have here a Hertzian dipole, a time-dependent Hertzian dipole, and this Hertzian magnetic dipole will also emit terahertz radiation. And the electric field of the terahertz radiation directly behind the sample, so the electric field of the terahertz pulse directly behind the sample, is proportional to the time derivative of the time-dependent magnetization, so d over dt of m. And uh, well, for the current, uh, for the spin transport, the electric field is directly proportional to the spin current amplitude itself. So this means we should just measure these two processes in one and the same terahertz emission setup. And this is also what we did. And let me share you the results here. So what do we have here? This is the terahertz emission signal as a function of time. And this red waveform here is the signal that we obtained from a single layer of cobalt iron. So this means the signal that we see here is simply due to the ultra fast rate of change of the photo excited uh, ferromagnetic sample. Okay, and you see that the signal is also very noisy. And uh, the reason is that the signal is very small. It's about a factor of 100 smaller than the terahertz emission signals that I have shown you before. And uh, therefore you also uh, see more noise, but this is clear, yeah, because this is magnetic dipole radiation, and magnetic dipole radi radiation is typically much weaker than electric dipole radiation. So let, now let's put a uh, platinum on top of the cobalt iron and look at the signal that arises from the ultra fast spin current. And this is the blue waveform here. And you see, well, this blue waveform has almost or has almost identical dynamics like the red waveform here. Interesting. But maybe this is just a coincidence. So let's go for a different material. Let's go now for a ferromagnet called cobalt iron boron. So we obtain this uh, waveform here for just the single layer of this material. And if we add platinum to it and measure the transport, you see we obtain this blue waveform. And again, the two waveforms, the red and the blue one, have very similar dynamics. Hmm. Maybe these two ferromagnets, cobalt iron and cobalt iron boron, are too similar to each other. So let's take a totally different ferromagnet. Let's take permaloy. Permaloy just consists of nickel and iron. So it's a, it's a, it's a compound of nickel and iron, an alloy. And you see that we now obtain this uh, red waveform here. And you also see that this red waveform has a different shape compared to the red waveforms in uh, these two other magnets. So it's more unipolar here, whereas these waveforms are more bipolar. Okay, now let's see whether the signal from the nickel iron, now with platinum on top, uh, looks like. And you see, again, the waveforms are the same, even though the time dynamics is very different to the other ferromagnets. And this is remarkable because 
It means the following. It means that the electric field of the terahertz pulse behind just a ferromagnetic layer has the same dynamics like the electric field of the spin current emission from this two-layer stack. And this basically implies that the rate of change of the magnetization in the single ferromagnetic layer has the same temporal dynamics like the spin current in the two-layer sample. And uh, you can also check this explicitly by extracting the rate of change of the magnetization and the dynamics of the spin current from these terahertz emission signals, as I showed you earlier in this tutorial. And uh, the result is shown here. So what you see here is now the spin current in the sample uh, with the ferromagnet uh, cobalt iron and platinum on top. And you see at negative time delays, there's no spin current. But now at time zero, the pump pulse arrives and you get a spin current, which very quickly rises to its maximum. Then it decays, then it becomes even negative, And finally, it approaches zero again. And uh, you can now compare this to the rate of change of the single ferromagnetic layer sample. And you see that this has the same dynamics. And this is also the case for the other ferromagnets as shown here. And interestingly, for the nickel iron sample, so the permalloy, you see that the relaxation dynamics is substantially slower than for the other two ferromagnets. You see that this slope here is uh, significantly slower, less steep than for the other two ferromagnets shown here. But again, the ultra-fast demagnetization rate of uh, the single F-layer has the same dynamics as for the two-layer sample. So these data again directly show that uh, the ultra-fast rate of demagnetization of a single ferromagnetic layer, for example, like cobalt iron, has the same dynamics like the spin transport from the cobalt iron and to an adjacent N layer. And this is remarkable because these two samples are different and also the two, the two signals that we measure here are very different observables. But these data therefore suggest that the demagnetization rate of a single F layer sample and a spin current into a, inside such a stack, two layer stack, that they have nearly identical time evolution. So how can we explain this? And this is now the, the final step of the, the terahertz uh, emission spectroscopy work steps. It's the step in which we interpret our data, in which we try to explain what's going on. And of course, you can usually do this with a simple model. And as a model, we use here the stoner model of uh, ferromagnetism. So it's shown here. So what you see here is the density of states versus energy for spin up electrons and spin down electrons. And this is the typical stoner model. You see that we have here more uh, electrons with spin up below the Fermi energy than spin down electrons. And this means that this material is ferromagnet, simply ferromagnetic, because simply we have more spin up electrons than spin down electrons. Okay, so this is the Fermi level. And now we excite the system with a femtosecond pump pulse. And this means we excited, yeah, we, we reshuffle the energy and the populations of the electrons. And what happens now? Well, we are interested in ultra-fast demagnetization. And ultra-fast demagnetization means we get a spin flip from spin up to spin down states, for example, shown here. And the probability of such a process is proportional to the occupation number of the spin down, spin up states minus the occupation number of the spin down state, as shown here. So the occupation number of the up state minus the down state is proportional to the uh, probability that we get the spin flip event here. But of course, we need to integrate this over all possible energy of the electrons. And that's why we have this integral here. And also importantly, this integral has a weighting factor, which depends on the density of states here and also of, on matrix elements and other microscopic details. Okay, this is what we get for the ultra-fast demagnetization, but this is still too complicated. Now you can do something which is called the Sommerfeld expansion. So you assume that the, the energy dependence of this weighting factor matrix elements, density of states, and so on, is relatively weak. And this means you can linearize it around the Fermi energy M0. Yeah? So we just linearize this weighting factor here. And then you get a very interesting result. You get this result here shown in the yellow box. The rate of change of the magnetization is proportional to a term that grows with delta mu s. And delta mu s is the so-called generalized spin voltage. 
it's nothing but the integral over uh, the occupation numbers of up electrons minus down electrons. So why is this called spin voltage? Because if these occupation numbers are Fermi Dirac functions, and this is not necessary here, uh, because this consideration was totally general and uh, also reasonable, because after femtosecond excitation, we do not have Fermi Dirac uh, functions here anymore. But let's assume now that these n occupation numbers are Fermi Dirac functions, then we obtain that uh, this integral here is the difference between the chemical potential of spin up electrons minus the chemical potential of spin down electrons. And this is called in normal spintronics the spin voltage. And that's why we here call it the generalized spin voltage. Okay, this is the first term that contributes to the ultra fast demagnetization, the different chemical potential of spin up and spin down electrons. But there's a second term here, and this is simply the, the difference of the general of the generalized temperatures between spin up and spin down electrons. So how can you how is this defined? This uh, difference of the generalized temperatures. It's simply uh, the occupation numbers weighted with the electron energy. And uh, well, if these distribution functions n up and n down are again Fermi Dirac functions, then they simply reduce to the ordinary temperatures of the spin up electrons and the spin down electrons. And that's why we call this integral here the generalized temperature difference. Okay, so this means you get spin flips because of a split of the chemical potential but also because of a difference of the temperatures of spin up and spin down electrons. So this was now the ultra fast demagnetization in, in a single layer of a ferromagnet. But we also have samples with two layers where we attach a non-magnetic layer to our ferromagnetic layer. The non-magnetic layer is uh, not ferromagnetic. That's why the uh, density of states of spin up and spin down electrons looks the same. And now you can basically do the same again. You can count spin transmission uh, events from the F layer and to the N layer, and also uh, for spin down electrons, count them again, uh, do the four, same uh, trick as for the ultra fast demagnetization, apply the same procedure. And then we obtain this relationship here. Again, uh, the spin transport from the F layer and to the N layer is proportional to one term that contains the spin voltage. So the difference between the uh, chemical potential of spin up and spin down electrons, but then additional terms, which just uh, arise from the temperature difference of uh, spin up electrons on the F layer, spin down electrons on the N layer, which is this term here. And then the same again for the spin down electrons. Yeah, So the temperature difference between electrons in the F down system and uh, the downspins in the N layer, which is this one here. Okay, now let's compare this result to our experimental findings. But in our experiment, we find that the rate of change of the magnetization and the ultra fast spin current have identical dynamics. But this is only possible if uh, these temperature terms are negligible. Then we can. Um, only then we can reproduce our experimental findings yeah, that the ultra fast rate of demagnetization has the same dynamics like the spin current. And, and if, if we can neglect then the, the, the temperature terms, it means everything is driven simply by delta mu s, so the spin voltage, the difference between spin up and spin down chemical potentials. Okay, and this is the first uh, important conclusion here the dynamics of the spin transport and the ultra fast demagnetization are simply driven by the spin voltage, the difference of the chemical potential of spin up and spin down electrons. And I should mention that there's an even more um, intuitive explanation or interpretation of this spin voltage, which uh, I would like to show here. And for this purpose, let's just consider the magnetization of the ferromagnet as a function of temperature. So this is the equilibrium magnetization of iron, for example, as a function of temperature. And as we increase the temperature, the magnetization approaches zero at the cure temperature. And here we get a phase transition from a ferromagnet into a paramagnetic material. Okay, and what happens in our experiment? In our experiment, we start at uh, the ambient temperature, room temperature, for example, 300 K. We start here. We excite the sample with our laser pulse and we get an increased 
electron temperature, this one here. And now we have a sample with a certain magnetization M, which is here. But actually, the sample would like to approach this new magnetization. And the difference between the actual magnetization of the sample and the magnetization the sample would like to achieve, this is nothing but the spin voltage. And that's why we can call the spin voltage basically an excess of magnetization that the sample would like to release. So the spin chemical potential or the spin voltage is nothing but an excess magnetization. Yeah? The difference between the actual magnetization and the magnetization the sample would like to have. And uh, you can now um, combine this uh, uh, this result here with uh, with uh, with uh, these equations. So the rate of change of the magnetization and the spin current, and then we will obtain quite straightforwardly the dynamics of the spin voltage. And you see that the dynamics of the spin voltage is basically driven by the dynamics of the electron temperature, which is shown here in this integral. Uh, I should say it's the rate of the the, the time derivative of the electron temperature times uh, a memory function, which is this exponential here. And this exponential has a time constant, uh, 1 over gamma ES. And this is the famous electron spin relaxation time. It tells us how quickly do the temperatures of uh, spins and electrons uh, equilibrate with each other. And this is given by this inverse time constant gamma ES, yeah, which is this memory function in this integral here. Okay, and uh, basically uh, all of these uh, parameters are given here. So the, dynam the, the dynamics of the electron temperature of the ferromagnet is given by literature values. We just need to know the electron phonon relaxation time, gamma EP inverse. This is given in the lit literature and typically of the, of the order of half a picosecond. And then finally, what we also need is to know the, the dynamics of the electron temperature is the ratio of electron on total heat capacity. All of this is known. And the only free parameter and uh, the dynamics here is given by this electron spin relaxation time. And with this, we can now fit uh, the measured uh, dynamics by simply one fit parameter, the electron spin relaxation time. So this is shown here for cobalt iron boron. What you see is here the rate of magnetization change as a function of time. And you see, we can really nicely fit this with our model. And the only fit parameter is the electron spin relaxation time and here, this is 100 femtosecond. And this is in very good agreement with uh, other measurements in the literature by different techniques. So now we do this also for the spin transport. And again, we get more pretty much the same electron spin relaxation time, 100 uh, femtoseconds again. Finally, let's change the ferromagnet from cobalt iron boron to permaloy. Because we know in permaloy, the dynamics, the relaxation dynamics is faster, uh, slower, I should say. It's here, shown here. And let's fit it again. And you see now the electron spin relaxation time is indeed much slower. Uh, it's of the order of 190 femtoseconds. So a factor of two uh, slower than for these other materials. And also this slower dynamics is very consistent with measurements of ultra fast demagnetization uh, by other techniques in the literature. Okay, and this good agreement between experiment and theory indicates that uh, that basically we have captured the basic physics that is going on here. And uh, the picture that we obtain is as follows. At time zero, the sample is excited with the femtosecond laser pulse, and we then instantaneously increase the spin voltage. And once we have a spin voltage, the sample wants to get rid of spins. It wants to get rid of magnetization. And uh, in the course of this, uh, spin flips happen, and they will reduce the spin voltage. But at the same time, also the electrons cool down, and this will also to lead to a reduction of uh, the spin voltage. And that's why we get this uh, dynamics here, as we as we can see. Okay, so this brings me to the summary. So from the terahertz emission spectroscopy of two-layer samples and single ferromagnetic layers, we can learn that terahertz spin transport and ultra-fast demagnetization are driven by one and the same force, the heat-induced spin voltage. And why is this signif significant? It's significant because about ultra-fast demagnetization, it's a very old effect. Yeah? It's 25 years old. There's a lot of knowledge. We can now take all of this knowledge and apply it to spin transport. And this will hopefully also guide us to maximize the spin current to get maximum terahertz emission.
And uh, well, uh, this uh, study also shows us that temperature difference, temperature differences between F and N are of minor relevance. It seems they are not important. And uh, we also saw that the time constant of uh, the ultra fast demagnetization doesn't change uh, when we get spin transport. So it seems that the spin transport into this N layer is only a small perturbation. And a very sim or a very rough estimate shows that actually only 10% of the spin voltage or less are used for spin transport. The other 90% of the spin transport uh, of the spin voltage disappear because of local spin flips. So this means we can, in principle, increase the, the spin current amplitude by a factor of up to 10. And this would give us a factor of 10 more terahertz emission amplitude. And this, of course, would be great, yeah, because then the spintronic terahertz emitter would, yeah, become much more efficient. And uh, yeah, finally, also these results show that we can measure the spin transport easily and therefore also map out the dynamics of the spin voltage, which is usually very difficult. Yeah, well, and uh, this is now the, the big summary of this tutorial. Spintronic terahertz emission provide us with new insight into magnon dynamics uh, and anti-ferromagnets, but also into the mechanism of laser-induced spin transport in, in metallic samples, which are then driven by the spin voltage. And uh, so it also shows actually that spintronic terahertz emission is interesting for, for applications, for example, terahertz wave generation. Yeah, and in the future, it would be great to apply this to, for example, more complex structures, chiral materials, topological materials, for example, uh, as, uh, as uh, Xiao Jun does in, in her works. And of course, it would be great to increase the sensitivity and the temporal and spatial resolution of, uh, of terahertz emission spectroscopy. That's also what is being done by a group uh, uh, by Dan Middleman in the uh, US. They, they combine near field microscopy with uh, tips uh, with terahertz emission spectroscopy. And then you get sub 100 nanometer spatial resolution of terahertz emission. And this is, of course, very interesting for inhomogeneous samples. Yeah, with these words, I have arrived at the end. So I, I was asked by my colleague, uh, Katharina Franka, to advertise a position. She does terahertz STM, so scanning tunneling microscopy. If you are interested, please contact her. But uh, yeah, with these words, I have arrived at the end of my talk. And uh, I'm happy to discuss now questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for the Professor Tobias Kempas. Actually, there is one question from the q and box in the Zoom meeting. Uh, this is for related to the first part. The question is, is there any research examples for charge transfer in biological samples by using terahertz emission spectroscopy, as you mentioned in the introduction part? Yes, so there was a question. <laughs> Yes, yeah, absolutely. So the question was, is there also uh, an example of terahertz emission spectroscopy for charge transfer in biological samples? And indeed, there is there's a paper from um, from the Riedler group uh, 15 years ago. I think it was in Munich. So they, they looked at bacterial rhodopsin. So bacterial rhodopsin is uh, the molecule that is responsible in our eyes and our retina for the vision process. And the first process, uh, the, the first step of the vision process, I think, is connected to a, a, a charge transfer in this molecule yeah, and a, re for, a, re, a, a re restructuring of this molecule. And this first um, charge transfer process can be measured by terahertz emission spectroscopy. So here we have the sample. Uh, you need uh, bacterial rhodopsin molecules. They need to be aligned. If they are random, then we would get uh, zero terahertz emission because everything would average away. But you can order them by, by some... Um, smart sample preparation, I guess, uh, with uh, external electric fields also. Then you take the sample, excited with a, with a femtosecond laser pulse, and then you get a charge transfer along this yellow arrow that emits terahertz radiation. And this is something you can measure. And by analyzing these, um, these, these terahertz waveforms, uh, you, can, you can basically learn that this transport is, that this charge transfer here is not only due to electrons, it's also due to protons. And uh, more details are then described in this paper from 2008, if you're interested. So it's not only electron transport here, but also proton transport, which is responsible for this very slow dynamics shown in red here. Okay. Yeah, I also have another question. 
And uh, while my friend asked, want to ask me to ask you this question that whether they can be used the beacon signal to inter illuminate the spintonic materials and direct care just like the two DFB lasers and they give the beating and they get the CW continuous wave from the spintronic material. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. Yeah, so. Uh, so you can also, uh, so in this picture, uh, we excite a sample with a femtosecond laser pulse. So it's basically like a delta function, like a Dirac delta function. But you could also take two waveforms, two, uh, two uh, continuous wave lasers with slightly different frequency, let's say 400 terahertz and the other one at 402 terahertz. Then the intensity of the resulting beam would beat at two terahertz. And then the structure should emit terahertz uh, radiation with uh, two terahertz and um, we have tried this already uh, but we were not very successful uh, uh, at least not in our first experiment we tried to generate uh, uh, continuous wave terahertz emission but in our first experiment we were not very successful we have to increase our our signal to noise ratio and then you'll try it again but actually it should work in principle this should work okay so the <laughs> So if there is a signal, if there is a signal, it will be unfortunately relatively small. Okay. Yeah. So I cannot hear you anymore. Uh, you are silent. I mean, if the yeah, it can be used to generate a continuous wave terahertz, whether it can be used to as the uh, terahertz source for the wireless communication. Uh, this would be great, absolutely. Yeah. So we have tried it uh, quick and dirtily, but uh, the, the, we have to do it more thoroughly. Yeah. So in a, in, a, in another try. But in principle, uh, this should work. Yeah. Continuous wave generation should also work with the spintronic emitter. We have tried, uh, but it was uh, we have to improve. Yeah. Okay. There is another question. Yes. As we know, the nonlinear optics is also a very effective way to generate terahertz waves, such as in the Zincotera and Nissan Airbay. The thermal model is a good explanation for spintronic emitter. Is it also can be treated as a nonlinear method? I mean, his question is that whether this thermal model can also be treated as a kind of nonlinear method. What is the difference? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that is related to this third part about the phenosecond uh, no. demagnetization. It's, it's, uh, the, the, uh, the question is perfectly correct. Yeah. So, uh, you can also treat this as a black box. And then you can say, I feed my black box with a pump field and we get a signal which scales with the pump field squared. So, what is the conclusion that uh, inside this black box, we have a chi 2 process? Yeah. So, a nonlinear chi 2 process. And that's why you can describe the whole uh, the whole black box by by a chi two tensor. This definitely works, and we also do this in the in the 2016 paper. We estimate the chi two uh, tensor of uh, of the spintronic emitter and uh, uh, come up with an estimate of the of the amplitude of the chi two. Absolutely correct. But this is a macroscopic approach. Yeah, it's a macroscopic approach. A black box. If you want to know what's going on microscopically, then then you need a microscopic model, as shown here. Uh, but right. these are two complementary approaches. The first one that I showed is black box approach, a phenomenological approach. It gives you the chi two, a phenomenological parameter. But this here is a microscopic approach. Yeah, it, it it gives us more information what might go on on a microscopic level inside the material. Okay. There is another question from the online platform. Oh, I should say there are more than several thousand people are watching this online uh, tutorial. And there is another question from the online platform that since uh, you have already mentioned that the terahertz, uh, the terahertz emission spectroscopy as a powerful tool, to study materials, especially for the ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic. And uh, when the terahertz emission spectroscopy can be as powerful and as normal uh, characterization 
um, tool such as like the Raman spectroscopy or FTIR like that. It is commercial. I mean, this question is I think it's when, when the terahertz emission spectroscopy can be used as a commercial uh, e in instrument and installed <coughs> in the normal laboratory and the, the material scientist can just uh, press your button and then get the uh, result, get the data and they get their physical models like uh, that. I, I, think that's yes. a, I think that's a question. Yeah. I think I think yes, yeah, because uh, terahertz emission spectroscopy, in my opinion, is an underrated technology or an underrated experimental technique. Uh, why do I think this? Because uh, up to 2000, there were a few terahertz emission works, and then say up to 2010 or so, it was really not many groups worked on terahertz emission spectroscopy. But I would say in the recent decade, many more people have rediscovered terahertz emission spe spectroscopy of a great tool. And I think the number of groups is increasing. And why is this the case? Because, uh, yeah, I think because of this reason here, because photocurrents are ubiquitous in science and technology. And that's why I think it will be, it, it has the potential for uh, a really standard lab technology. So what are the what are the problems? Yeah, you need a femtosecond laser system, which is a bit more expensive, but now femtosecond laser systems become cheaper and cheaper. So that's why I think uh, that this is not a big problem anymore in the in the near future. Then what is a problem to a problem is to extract the currents, but I think one can also do this uh, sooner or later very reliably if you have the right uh, uh, reference emitter, and we are at the moment working on this, yeah, to to identify good reference emitters to calculate back to the current. And I think then, uh, if people can really calculate back to the current, uh, it's such a, a clear observable. It's like measuring a current with an oscilloscope. I think it really has a uh, it has a great potential for future applications uh, for many research groups, also beyond experts like like terrorists, people like you, Xiao Zhu. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I don't have any questions from yeah from the Zoom meeting and also from the online platforms. I think it's already uh, nine. So I see one. Uh, oh, so you... I, see, I see one oh, question. Here, here in the, in another the chat. one. Yes. Yeah. Do you think the ultra fast demagnetization is due to spin flip or spin transport or the change of the spin voltage? Okay, so the change of the spin voltage. Okay, let let me briefly explain it. Yeah. It's very quick. So here's the here's the terahertz emission uh, in the I'm oh, sorry. So here's the here's the slide. Okay. So what happens? Yeah. So we excite the, the ferromagnet with a femtosecond laser pulse. We generate a spin voltage. The spin voltage generates a spin current, but it also triggers a spin flips inside the ferromagnet. Both of these processes, yeah, the spin current and also the spin flips, lead to a decay of the spin voltage. Now the question is, what is the dominant decay process? Is it the spin flips or is it the spin transport? We believe it's the spin flips. So this means we waste, we waste most of the spin voltage for spin flips and not for a spin current. So that's why uh, we can still get a lot of spin transport if we just know how to yeah, how to uh, reduce the, the, the conductivity of the interface. We need to reduce the conductivity or we need to uh, increase the, the conductivity of the interface or decrease the resistivity of the interface. And if this is possible, we can get more spin current into the non-magnetic layer and therefore get more terahertz emission amplitude. So this is the task for the future. Make the interface more conductive. Yeah, and uh, yeah, at the moment, I don't know how, but uh, I guess there will be solutions by because more groups are working on this. Yeah. 